Okay, good evening. Um, I'm going to change the pace of the evening a little bit and I'm going to tell you two stories um, and then talk to you about what I've been doing for the last two years. So my Eureka moment happened after I heard these two stories. So the first story that I'm going to tell you is about Fareen. Fareen came to my classroom and Fareen's photo is gone. Ah, there it is. Fareen came to my classroom two years ago and um, a very, very passionate girl. She was um, eager to learn and um, she came to my class and when I diagnosed her academically, she was two, two years behind her private school peers. Um, she, so we started this huge intervention and we started teaching her and we started invent, investing her in education and she started learning very, very eagerly and then suddenly she stopped coming to school. And so I went to her house and I saw that the corporation had broken down the house and I lost Fareen. A couple of months later, exactly like I think a month and a half later, Fareen returns to school looking extremely um, devastated and her smile had lost its charm. And I asked her, where were you for these one and a half months? And she said that, Bahut time waste ho gaya hai, abhi mujhe jaldi se padhana shuru karo. So, which meant that I've lost a lot of time, quickly start teaching me. So we went back to, you know, catching up what we'd lost. That afternoon after school, I walked home with Fareen and I saw her living under the Goregaon flyover with literally a shed, uh, a tarpaulin sheet and she lives there with her three-year-old sister and a drug addict of a mother and she takes care of that family. That's Fareen's story. Fareen today is in the third grade. She's bridged one and a half years and she wants to grow up and maximize her potential because education changed her life. The second story happened um, and so Fareen actually taught me this huge concept of grace under pressure and what it truly means. The second story that I would like to share with you is about this nameless boy that I met on Monday, this Monday. I was going to, I was going to work and uh, this young boy, my rickshaw stopped at the traffic signal and this young boy uh, selling coloring books comes up to my rickshaw trying to um, sell me his coloring books and I noticed his fingers were bleeding. So I hop out of the rickshaw, buy a bottle of water and, I, and, I, and I'm trying to clean his fingers and I start talking to him, you know, where do you live? He says, I live with other children in a nearby slum. I said, what do you like doing? So I, he said, I like coloring. And I said, well, good for you, you have so many coloring books. Then he looked very suspiciously at me and said, are you mad? These coloring books are meant to be sold and not colored in. So I said, let me buy you two coloring books. And I dug out a box of cray crayons and we colored. I said, you know, I'm going to come back tomorrow morning and we'll do the same thing tomorrow morning. The next morning when I went and I stood at the same traffic signal at the same time, I couldn't find him on Wednesday again. I couldn't find him on Thursday. There was another little boy selling the same coloring books. And I asked him, where's that little boy who was selling coloring books on Monday? And he looked around and, uh, and the lights were going to turn green and he said, which means that he didn't sell enough coloring books and so the state killed him. And this boy taught me a very, very, very important thing which is a sense of urgency. And two years ago, a very, very ordinary boy left a very interesting career and, and wanted to do something extraordinary. And he knew that there was there were many children out there who were important and precious and needed an education. And he was researching online on what exactly was this extraordinary thing that he was going to do. And he read something very, very abysmal. He read that one in every three child drops out of school before the fifth grade. And if you really take a second and think about this statistic, it means that one out of three children in our country do not graduate from the fifth grade. And that is not only abysmal, it's frightening. And so this young man, he came to Bombay and he joined this beautiful movement called Teach for India. And Teach for India, it's not easy to join Teach for India. Teach for India demands two years of your life. It, it requires you to be not just a teacher in a low-income classroom, it requires you to be a leader to end this very, very in human inequity in education which uh, plagues our country. And so Teach for India was something that I did for two years. And when I walked into my first classroom, I had these 49 children who were more than uh, three to four years behind their, their private school peers. And thus began this conversation of how am I going to amplify 
the dreams and potential of these 49 children. And it wasn't an easy thing to do. Uh, you, you have to, so, so if I explain my classroom to you, it's 49 kids who come from Bombay's darkest slums. They live in 10 by 10 rooms with 15 member families. Um, they fight every day for a square meal. They fight to stand in a line and fill water. They do not have a patient ear in the house. They don't have a nurturing touch. They don't have the luxury to be uh, creative and to amplify their dreams. And then they came to this classroom where I suddenly told them, you can be who you want to be. When I walked into that classroom, I asked them one question. Bade ho ke kya banna hai? And the answers that I got back uh, shocked me. They said, bade ho ke vegetable sell karna hai. Bade ho ke uh, uh, building mein jhadu pocha karna hai. And I didn't know how to debrief this with a group of 10-year-old kids. And that's when I learned that I need to break them out of this cycle of mediocrity and really, really make them aspire. And how can I do that? How can I stop them from thinking small dreams? How can I start them to believe that excellence is possible for every single one of them? And this is how we did it. We started making the classroom not an isolated space. We started inviting people to come into our classrooms. We started taking the children out on field trips, simple field trips like we took them to a bookstore and we allowed them to spend time there. We took them to, uh, we took them to luxury brand stores and we said, these are the things which are being sold and can you understand the meaning of aspirations through this? We started inviting different walks of, uh, people from different walks of life to come in and, and talk to them. And today it's been two years, they've bridged a lot of academic differences, but the most important thing is that they believe that they can be who they want to be. These children are not optionless anymore. They have voices, they're confident, they speak with confidence, and they know that there are many things in the world which they can have. And an interesting story happened on Tuesday morning when one of my, one of my 14 year old girls who I was teaching called me up and said, I've got admission into the best private school in Bandra. Will you come and pay my fees? And I was like, that was, that was a moment of pride because you know, two years of immense, immense challenges to teach children. It was so frustrating when you're teaching them concepts for three months, four months, and they don't get it. And then finally, change happens. However slow it is, it happens. And, and I realized that amplifying the dreams and potentials of these children was something that I needed to do. The second thing that I learned was you cannot serve small. Your serving small doesn't help anybody. And that happens if you have an immense sense of possibility. I, my kids came from, they could have been, it would have been very easy for them to give many excuses. They could have said, Bijli nahi hai, electricity nahi hai, we don't have, uh, we don't have resources. And I said, if I start allowing these excuses to become the cornerstone of my classroom, we will never see excellence. We will never reach our fullest potential. And so with an immense sense of possibility, I walked into the classroom saying that I might not have I might not have many things. I might not have a fan on my ceiling. I might not have a library as good as other schools. I might not have beautifully painted walls, but I have the will to change the lives of these children. And I also learned compassion. And I learned compassion when I first walked into a slum in Bombay. And I realized that compassion lies truly in the heart of the families that the children, from where the children come. And I realized that the parents that uh, send these children to school have huge expectations of these kids. They might be poor, they might think another set of hands could mean another set of income, but these kids and these parents truly believe that education is the cornerstone and education can really, really change, change, their, uh, change the way they perceive life. And before I proceed, I'm going to 